thanks, Jonathan. Uh, cool. So at Superbolist, we've been using Kubernetes since about like the end of 2015, but I'll get more into that in a couple of slides. Um, Someone just asked about the image in the slide, um, so I'm going to add some context to it because I use similar images further on in the slides. Um, they're not my images. They're from the Deus.com Ill Children's Illustrated Guide to Kubernetes. They're, it's like a really cute comic and video explaining Kubernetes and some Docker stuff also if you are interested. Uh, so the giraffe is Flippy, which is an example app deployed to your Kubernetes cluster. Um, the sort of owl in the middle is Captain Cube, who's the pilot of the ship, which is Kubernetes, because Kubernetes means pilot in Greek, and it, because it manages your cluster. Uh, and then the gopher is just the Golang gopher logo, because Kubernetes is written in Go, and Go is really hipster. Uh, <laughs> and then the whale is, in the distance, is the Docker whale, which is also written in Go, and questionable. Uh, so my first slide, I just want to cover the, that in this talk, I'm not going to go very in depth into like some of the really interesting, powerful things in Kubernetes, because unfortunately, I don't have the time. <laughs> cool. Uh, I'm glad that didn't go off the stage. Uh, and I'm also not going to really compare Kubernetes to Swarm, SwarmKit, InfraKit, all the Docker Incorporated cluster management stuff, or Mesos Marathon, Mesos Aurora, any of those kinds of things, because I don't have any experience in them, really. Uh, so this is a tweet by Kelsey Hayatau, who's a Google employee who does a lot of community evangelist stuff for Kubernetes and cloud-native apps and services in general. Uh, that's me. I'm the team lead of the DevOps team at Superbolist. I know DevOps isn't supposed to be a team thing, but it supposedly is. Our official internal team name is Site Reliability, because that's sort of what we do. But we also do like development, tooling, release engineering, all the things Google and Facebook calls it. Um, who is Superbolist? Superbolist.com is uh, e-commerce company based only in South Africa. We're owned by Take A Lot. Uh, we're part of the Take A Lot division with uh, Mr. Delivery also. Um, we aim to be the number one fashion destination for 18 to 35 year olds. So some of you in this room might not have heard of us or not been interested in us. Uh, I think that's okay. Um, I think people also have like misconceptions about what we are because we sell male and female clothing and we sell like apartment stuff as well. Uh, our stack, our legacy stack is mainly PHP. It's really pretty PHP if you're willing to believe that's a thing. Um, <laughs> with some Python and Django as well. Um, but I'll get more into all of that. So Black Friday 2015, we had one service running in Kubernetes. Um, our mobile API so like the main things we have that clients use, like external clients is, so all our customers is our two native apps and then mobile web and normal web. Um, in 2015 is when we launched our native mobile clients. So then for Black Friday in November 2015, our one app was already running in it. We'd moved from Rackspace to Google Cloud a bit earlier that year. I wasn't involved with that. I hadn't joined. But there was like an amazing amount of work done to that. And some of that's still alive today. And it was like really good work, mostly in Bash, with like a custom deployment process that works really well and still is alive today. But for high availability, which I'll get into in this slide, which basically means that if one of your services goes down, you can still write to memcached or whatever. And or the site will still be up if one of your server, if your main, one of your servers fall o falls over. So, in South African context, or at least at our scale, we have a lot of servers servers that weren't being used to their full capacity. Um, in case something like one of them fell over for whatever reason. But now, because things are in containers and we can manage their resources more closely, managing multiple processes on a single server 
we can get our resource usage a bit higher. We don't really want to get to 100% because that doesn't really cater for spikes in traffic, et cetera. But it does look a lot better than it did where some of our servers were using 5% of CPU and RAM and disk and everything. Um, so enter Docker. So Docker is sort of like a virtual machine. Um, that's sort of what it does. I think David had a similar slide in his slides where it offers containerization so you run like a sort of mini server on top of a server but it shares kernel, the kernel with your main server so you get more efficient resource usage compared to if you're running full virtual machines on top of a virtual machine, um, which obviously has performance benefits. Uh, the biggest benefit Docker has, or the thing I most appreciate about Docker is the Docker file. Um, if you've looked at how LXC generally, people build LXC images or rocket images when they're not using Docker, the files look really complicated and they're a lot harder for the average developer to edit, where I think a Docker file makes a lot more sense. You can test each line in your terminal if you like the majority of the lines that look more complex like this pip install line and you also have a huge base set of images to use that are all public. So this, to go through this Docker file as an example, what it does is it uses the base Python Docker image uh, from the Docker Hub, which basically is like a snapshot of a small like Debian install with Python installed. Then you add your requirements, which are like whatever your dependencies are for running this app, and then you pip install the requirements, and then you add the rest of your source code. Docker has really efficient build caching, which is also a huge benefit. So what, because it hashes each of these add lines, it knows that if anything in the source directory changes that isn't a requirements.txt, it only invalidates the bottom line. So it only has to run that line again when rebuilding, which is, means that you can have a Docker build that's seconds. Um, and then only if your requirements.txt changes does it go back those full three lines and repip install. Kubernetes, where Kubernetes comes in is with Docker, what people sometimes, the two terms people use when talking about Docker sometimes interchangeably are containers and images. Though they're technically different things. An image, a Docker image is a snapshot of that virtual machine, so like with that whole file system. And then a container is a running version of that snapshot. Uh, Kubernetes manages running those Docker containers for us, as well as a bunch of other benefits it does. So in this image, Flippy's thinking about multiple replicas of the app being run because that's one of the useful things you can easily do in Kubernetes. And you generally want to do when scaling out a website. What is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a container cluster manager. What that actually means is you have a bunch of servers that report into a Kubernetes master API, uh, which we, in this diagram is that badly outlined white box on the left. Each of the developers speaks to the master API, and then each node, on each node you have a kubelet, which is a binary that reports into the master API what kind of resources each of these nodes has, and what Docker containers or whatever containers are currently running on, your, on that node. So they don't really know about each other and they rely on the Kubernetes master dealing with that cross node stuff. Um, you don't have to run Docker to run Kubernetes. You can also use Rocket, but those are the only main two ones they go for. They're both pretty good when it comes to... Docker's a bit easier to get into, but Rocket has a bunch of security benefits. It's made by Coros and it's built RKT. Uh, so to go into more this diagram a bit more, what happens is our developers originally would deploy directly to Kubernetes, which would, in our case, we use G Google Cloud Platform, so they have a container registry, which is actually an image registry. Um, and then developers would push their Docker images up to the Google Container Registry, and then tell the Kubernetes master API to deploy this version of the app, and then it would schedule those, those, however many replicas you want of that app to those nodes and make sure they're running happily. It does it in a pretty safe way, so what you do in Kubernetes is for your deployment, which is like the resource you use to declare your app, 
you give it all the runtime configuration it needs. So you give it the environment variables it needs. Uh, you give it health check URLs, or you can give it commands to run, which is useful for stuff like Redis, where you can run Redis CLI ping to health check whether your Redis is still running in that container. And then you also tell it how many replicas you want and what history of deployments you want to keep. And then it sort of manages the rolling updates. Because it has all the health checks in that deployment, it knows that when it brings up a new version of the app, it's going to wait for that health check to run before anything that wants to add it to a load balancer adds it to a load balancer. So in this case, what in the, on the right-hand side of this diagram, what happens is if someone opens the mobile web or the app or just it on a normal Chrome browser or web browser or whatever, then it first hits the Google load balancers, which is that cloud picture. Then it goes and hits a port on one of these nodes, which Kubernetes all automatically manages. Even, it even manages configuring that Google Cloud load balancer for you. And then it hits what sort of behaves like an internal load balancer within the cluster. So this, where is it? OK, I'll get it to it in a couple slides a bit, in a bit more detail. But what happens is, in Kubernetes, your like load balancers that are configured within the cluster and the deployments are completely separate things. So you can have, if you wanted, you could have a load balancer that load balances over two completely separate apps because when defining this deployment of your app, you define a set of labels, and then on the load balancer, you define a set of labels. So it just finds all healthy pods, which are like running Docker containers with the same labels, and then configures IP tables on each of these nodes to redirect traffic for that internal load balancer to one of those pods that are healthy, which is pretty useful. And it was a bit confusing at first because I'd make changes to a deployment and then the load balancer would suddenly not be serving traffic because the deployment would rolling update to only include Docker containers and pods which didn't match the labels of the load balancer. So here's sort of an example of deploying a Kubernetes app. Q Kubernetes has a CLI, which I much prefer, but it also has a complete web dashboard where you can deploy apps. So this is just an example app, um, which there's like another piece to it where you deploy a Redis container, and then you deploy this container, which basically just returns how many times someone's requested the URL. But you'll, what the things in this example are basically just the deployment name, so the app name that's unique, uh, what image you want to run, which would also be with the version of the image, which I'll get into more detail about, and then how many replicas of the image. And in this case, we're uh, also going to create an external service, which will configure Google Load Balancer, which redirects from, which routes traffic from port 80 to the target port, which is the port on the actual Docker containers, port 5000. Uh, so this is sort of an example of what happens in the Kubernetes master API. And this is the relationship between the different sort of internal resources that it uses. So the deployment, which is the main thing I've been talking about, is there's a shorthand term for it called the deploy, which makes sense. Um, it's sort of just the declarative what it wants that, what it wants it to look like right now. So in this sort of example, the first, when we first created the deployment, it just had app version one. Uh, so it created a replica set, which is what that RS stands for, inside that deployment, which made sure that N uh, versions of app version one were running on the nodes it has. And then, each of these independent pods, which the red ones are the ones that are being uh, killed in this case because we're rolling, up, rolling an update to the version two of the app. So those red ones are the dead ones and the green ones are the newer ones. But it sort of does this, you can configure how fast or slowly you want it to do the rolling update. And we generally do it one container at a time. So what it does is it brings up a new version of the app, makes sure it's healthy, then the load balance will, will also add it to the load balancing pool that it's load balancing over, and then kill a version of the old app, which is quite useful for slowly doing updates without causing downtime. 
So that was the deployment, and then the service, which I've sort of described to, is pretty magical. Uh, so you define, because of the power of the labeling stuff, and because in the deployment you declare all this runtime configuration, then the service also knows how to read the things that are set, all the like statuses set on that pod. So if, when doing a rolling update, when you start terminating a version one of the app, one of the containers running version one of the app, as soon as you start terminating it, the load balancer will pull it out of the pool that's load balancing over, which is useful. You can also do other things, like I made that example with a single load balancer load balancing over version one and version two of an app or two completely separate apps. You could use that for A-B testing or running a canary where you wanted to include it in a pool because you could have a deployment for your like stable version where you're running 10 replicas and then you could deploy one replica of like a canary release and then that would include that in the pool that load balances over, round robining over the 11 containers. Kubernetes, that's a perb list. So here is a picture of Captain Cube and Flippy in a sort of container with a lamp outside in the sun, maybe for nighttime, um, and the Docker whale having fun and causing havoc, because that's what Docker does sometimes. Uh, <laughs> But we, in 2016, we made a lot of progress moving more of our stuff into Docker. So we started moving to a servants-orientated architecture, so splitting out some of our apps into their own dedicated apps, like, for example, a single web app that manages user details or checkout or something. We've included, we've moved from what was originally four services in 2015 to over 15 now. Uh, a bunch of pretty small, a, a large portion of them are pretty small, but dedicated, simple services. We're also running on less than 20 servers. Our staging environment is, I think, on six servers at the moment, and we could, that's almost as, slow, as small as we could get it. So three of the servers are our Kubernetes cluster in staging, and then the other three are stuff we're still running on dedicated boxes in staging and production. The main one being MySQL, because running MySQL in containers isn't worth the effort, or at least at our scale, where we don't really benefit from like hardcore clustered uh, MySQL. And we're also hoping to move into Google Cloud SQL, which is their managed MySQL instances, because that's a lot easier for us. So then we also have moved 80% of our stuff into Kubernetes. So that's where MySQL comes in. It's one of the things we haven't moved into Kubernetes. And I'll get more into some of the other stuff we haven't moved into Kubernetes yet in the following slides. But one of the other serv dedicated servers we still have is a static proxy because dealing with selling people stuff and dealing with money, some of the like archaic payment vendors really like whitelisting static IPs. So we have a dedicated server just for that still. Whereas our Kubernetes cluster, those nodes are all cattle, not pets. We'll happily shoot one occasionally when we have weird issues in production. We do just put one down, um, and no one really cries too much. We, we use Google Container Engine, which is amazing. It means that at our size, our engineering team's about 20 people, which isn't that big, and our DevOps team's sort of two to five people, depending on the day of the week. Uh, borrowing people from other teams. So it's quite a benefit to, rely, to be able to depend on Google provisioning our Kubernetes master API, and they also provision our nodes for us. So on Black Friday last year, all we had to do is e resize the cluster, which you can also do in the web app. Uh, like the web GUI is just like edit the cluster and bring, like change the size of the cluster, and they'll automatically bring in new nodes. Kubernetes also does support node auto-scaling, and Google Container Engine now supports Kubernetes native node auto-scaling, I mean, node auto-scaling, because there is some scary stuff when it comes to that, because when you scale down again, it gets a bit scary, because you want to make sure everything's, nothing important is running on that node, especially anything serving traffic. Uh, in that regard, Kubernetes also has some amazing tooling, so with the kubectl, you can easily drain a node or 
caught in a node, which stops it anything new from being scheduled to it, which makes it really easy for us to also upgrade Kubernetes versions or anything, because in Google Cloud, you have multiple node pools or auto-scaling groups in under a single Kubernetes cluster all speaking to the same master API. So you can safely update the master API without affecting any of the nodes, and then bring in a new auto-scaling group or node pool, which is the Google Cloud terminology, for ones using the new version of the API or, and the new version of Kubelet, and then it will and then you can slowly drain the old nodes and scale that other old node pool down before moving everything to the new version. And that's all pretty smooth most of the time. There have been a few cases where strange things happen where even because we, things can't talk to the Kubernetes master API when it's getting scaled up, some stuff panics, but it shouldn't and it's got a lot better. Uh, what other terrible things have happened when we upgraded? Nothing that exciting. The kubectl drain, which is the thing for draining nodes, has got a lot better in the last year. When we first started using Kubernetes, the documentation was terrible. It's still not as good as it could be, but it's got way better. Um, and the like user experience is all a lot better than it was then, but still sort of terrible. We sort of skipped a bunch of the like difficult stuff for adopting Kubernetes by using Google Container Engine as well because for a long time until about halfway through last year, it was really hard to bring up your own cluster without a lot of knowledge of Kubernetes already, which is useful if you want to bring up like a production ready cluster, but if you just want to play around with it, that can be a bit frustrating. That's all got a lot better now. For a while, the only two things that were well supported was using Container Engine, which is what all the Kubernetes engineers used in their demos and was sort of basically cheating, I guess, sort of. Or Hypercube, which I'll also get into in a bit. But so, talking about Container Engine and Kubernetes, on Black Friday last year, all we had to do was scale up the node pool in the GUI and then also scale up the deployments for the relevant things that were struggling with the load. We easily, for Black Friday, we doubled the size of our no, uh, cluster, I think, and like doubled the amount of replicas for a bunch of stuff, and it all worked really well. That also slowly happened during the day where we slowly added more nodes as we needed them. Uh, so 2015 was obviously when we started moving stuff into Kubernetes, and I've sort of broken up some of the like struggles we've had into time periods. So that was when we first started moving into Kubernetes. I hadn't really used Docker that much. I'd played with Fig, which became Docker Compose, and I sort of knew what Docker was, but it was quite a jump like into the very deep end with Docker and Kubernetes. And for me, especially in the beginning, because Docker documentation isn't as good as it should be, and Kubernetes documentation isn't as good as it should be, and because I just didn't really know that much about either of them at that stage, sometimes debugging stuff was a bit difficult. I wouldn't really know what, whether the issue I was having was Docker-related or Kubernetes-related. Uh, I come from a developer background. Before Superbolist, I was pretty much like a pseudo full-stack engineer doing like Python backend stuff and some front-end JavaScript stuff and HTML, CSS, blah, blah. Uh, so coming into like ops and like a semi sysadmin role, whatever DevOps entails to you, I think everyone's definition varies a little, but like for me, it was nice that I didn't have to worry about a bunch of stuff. Kubernetes handled a bunch of knowledge, like stuff I wouldn't have been able to do easily myself. Like, the port management, because Kubernetes handles it, you don't have to make sure two like, different apps are using the same port because Kubernetes sets up a bunch of virtual networking on each node and within the cluster. Uh, so when it comes to like the YAML files that we have that describe our deployments, because that's sort of the most maintainable thing you can get back from the Kubernetes master API, you can get that or JSON, but YAML's a lot easier. So both 
with what used to like be before deployments and with deployments, it's really easy to change the image URL of which is like the Docker image version in the deployment. So for in the beginning, we didn't really source control those changes easily. But now, so what we started doing was fetching the YAML resources that existed in staging or production when doing a de new deploy. And then we would just either run like a set replace or there was some other stuff we did with other like bash replace. I guess nsubst is where that came in. So nsubst is sort of like bash replacement that you get when you like echo dollar sign message or echo dollar sign deployed image URL. If you've exported that, then it echoes that as a string. Uh, so we use that with said, and then with nsubst, we would store a version of the deployment in the repo, and then we'd just sort of generate a template from that at deploy time. Since then, we've moved to Ginger 2 because there are a bunch of benefits using like a proper full templating language. So with set and end subs, it would be easy to like change the Im image URL, even though it was a bit gross. Whereas like I think most developers have more experience with like Django templating or one of the other like Mustache or a PHP templating language. So Ginger 2 was a bit easier that way, though it did get a bit scary. But going. Now what we have is like a full Ginger 2 template where we share a bunch of stuff between different deployments for a single project. So in this instance, like a project is what you'd maybe call a service, except that's confusing when Kubernetes has its own resource called services. Uh, would be like if you have a Django project and an async worker, like a Celery worker and a Celery scheduler, you want those all probably to have the same envir environment variables the same image URL, and like probably the same like other labels, not the ones you use for load balancing, but it's useful to have those other labels when you want to get all the running pods or Docker containers, which some people might know, like from the master API. So in our case, you can say kubectl get pods uh, with the label app equals search or whatever, and then it returns all the pods for our internal search service. Um, and all its dependent services that nothing else talks to. Also, going back to before we used set and nsubst, it was easy to do just the image URL changing, but if you wanted to track the changing of environment variables or health checks or anything, tracking those was a bit more difficult. So now, because those templates are all committed to Git, at any point in time, you can check out a Git from, uh, like a git hash from the past and easily generate the templates that would have been generated at the time that we originally deployed that and that will still have the health checks and environment variables and amount of replicas that we deployed at that time because all of that's stored in the same git repo. The ephemeral containers thing's definitely been difficult, I think, for developers in general to grasp and it affected some of the historical stuff we had. And it also affected something, some more stuff that I'll get to in future slides. But so with Docker containers, when you run Docker, like multiple versions of a Docker image, or like multiple replicas of the same version of the Docker image, then each of those has their own runtime file system. Anything that's written to that file system doesn't exist or isn't like, not, no other running containers can see it. And when you do a rolling update, all of those files are gone. So originally, we would write some logs to file, and then people would get really frustrated because the logs would be gone, which makes sense. It's hard to debug stuff without any logs. Uh, migrations were another early issue we had where this isn't really necessarily a Kubernetes or Docker image issue, but is a general distributed systems issue where if you're trying to rolling update a version of an app or service or project and you need to make schema changes to the database, there's like a chicken and egg issue where you want to bring up the new versions of the app but you also want the, the columns to be there in the database or whatever and then 
originally what we did for that was a bit gross, and we'd bring up, we'd deploy this uh, Celery workers before we deployed the API or the scheduler for Celery. And then as soon as the first Celery worker was up for the new version of the app, we'd exec into it, which is like Docker exec, which sort of gives you an interactive like TTY in that running container, and then we'd run manage.py, migrate, or PHP orders, and migrate in the, term, in the Laravel world to run migrations, and we'd just make sure that that happened before the API new version was up where it ran, where it needed those database tables and columns to be there. Uh, it did mean that we had to break our, preferably break up our migrations into separate steps where we first add columns and then safely don't remove columns and then deploy the code that uses the new columns and not the old columns and then eventually delete the old columns that we didn't need anymore when no more versions of the old version of the app, no, many rep no more replicas of the old version of the app existed anymore. In the beginning of 2016 is when we really started moving more stuff into Kubernetes. It meant that we, we from the beginning and we still now cargo cult a bunch of like Docker and Kubernetes resources across repos. So we copy the, a scripts directory and a Kubernetes directory across repos when creating a new project and then find and replace user to check out or whatever if we bring up creating a new checkout service. And a bunch of that got a bit surf and it would take a couple, you'd have to run it a couple times to make sure that you'd got all the places you thought you needed to find and replace the name. But it works surprisingly well now. We've sort of sculpted that into what is semi-maintainable and semi-portable bash scripts and YAML resources. Uh, we're moving away from those in the future. But in 2016 is when we started playing with that. And in that regard, like kubectl and gcloud are really powerful tools or like they're CLIs, but they're really powerful when it comes to scripting. Both of them support custom formats and custom output uh, formatting and filtering. So with Kubernetes, with kubectl, you can say, okay, deploy, like get me all versions of a certain app that's running, but then get the image URL from the first one, which is useful for when we were originally finding and replacing the old version of the image URL to the new version. Uh, it also means we can easily get fetch like the pods that are running to exec into them. That's also quite convenient with Kubernetes is unlike some of the other like container managers which you have to SSH into the machine that is running the Docker container you want and then Docker exec. With Kubernetes you can just kubectl exec from your local machine and it like tunnels it through the master API to get you an uh, interactive terminal which is sort of like a shell on that container, which is quite useful. So that's when we started doing more of that as we moved more services in and people needed a Django shell to debug whatever issues or look at logs, which is quite useful. Local dev from the beginning has also been a bit of a struggle. Uh, originally, we'd just uh, test stuff outside of Kubernetes or Docker or anything, but that obviously skips one of the other benefits of Docker, which if you're running the same Docker image that on your local machine as you deploy it to production, it means you can skip a whole bunch of issues like installing requirements in your local virtual environment and then forgetting to add them to requirements.txt or whatever, and then trying to deploy code that explodes and vomits because it has, doesn't have the dependencies it needs. Uh, our legacy PHP app came from Vagrant and then our other like early Kubernetes stuff just used Docker Compose where originally it just used normal Docker Compose which was happy and then as we wanted to rely on more of the internal Kubernetes features, uh, a good example is that for each service that you have, so like an internal load balancer, each of those in Kubernetes you can talk to by just the service name. So if we have like a user app, you can just curl user hyphen app and it will resolve to the int, like the load, it will go via that internal load balancer, which is load balancing over all the user like API containers for the user service, and then give you like the root of that. So, what Kubernetes does is it also populates your environment variable, uh, your environment variables in each container you run with 
the IPs for each of these internal load balancers, so you can completely skip DNS, which means performance improvements, which is cool. Uh, so we wanted to rely on some of those, and then hacking, like editing Docker Compose to like export those same environment environment variables that we expected on in Kubernetes, where like or like new would be there in Kubernetes, but weren't there in Docker Compose was also a bit gross. Uh, so. Also, like from the ops perspective, being able to run a Kubernetes cluster on your local machine would be really useful. So, because we're a small South African startup, we don't have infinite money to burn bringing up an extra extra clusters to debug, uh, to like develop on. So, what we used first was Hypercube, which I briefly mentioned earlier. Which you'd run Docker and Docker on your local machine. It would bring up a single Kubernetes container that then knew how to create all the other doc Docker containers that need needs to be a single node Kubernetes cluster with the master API and the kubelets all running on that single node, which was useful and didn't mean that you needed like three virtual machines because it had like the minimum you needed stuff you needed to test Kubernetes stuff, which was really useful. Uh, especially when we started moving some stateful, more complicated stuff into Kubernetes like uh, uh, Kafka and Zookeeper, which we needed to test some of that internal service discovery, and that's a lot easier using proper Kubernetes because trying to recreate the same stuff in Docker Compose was just a mission. Uh, so we first used Hypercube for a while on VirtualBox or whatever, like Docker Machine variant or Docker on for our developers that use Linux. And that was, the most frustrating thing with that was, I think when Kubernetes 1.4 came out, and we are on 1.5 now, no, maybe it was a bit longer ago. A couple minor versions ago, they released a new version, and in that, the Hypercube docs just started 404ing, and we're like, this isn't supported anymore. Use this new thing we've just released called Minikube, which is much better and much lighter. It still causes issues sometimes for our developers, just because some stuff's a bit questionable. But what it uses is it's a fork of Docker machine, so you run, it manages a virtual machine on your computer. And we try use XHive or KVM, which are like native virtualization for Linux and or OS X and Linux, respectively. And XHive and Minikube just have the occasional bug, which can be frustrating. But at the same time, it means what developers run on their machine is identical or almost identical, like excluding our Google, the Google load balances, which we obviously don't have the source code for, on their local machines, which is really useful because it means you can debug everything and easily test like stuff you rely on in a Kubernetes cluster in production or staging. Uh, so the stateful stuff that I briefly mentioned was a bit frustrating also because back early, like in the beginning of last year, it was a bit difficult to run stateful stuff because even now it's not always recommended, but it, was, it works pretty well for services that know about clustering, like Kafka, Zookeeper, and Elasticsearch, they play really well inside clusters. But all the Kubernetes examples just use empty directories, which are a lot easier to manage than like if we have Google Cloud persistent disks, which each replica needs its own named one, and all the examples just used an empty directory, which means you could actually just say like replicas three and with the symbol like deployment example, and it would easily work where what we had to do instead is deploy, like create three separate deployments for like each elastic search node where we hard coded the name of the GC persistent disk for each one. Uh, so as we moved in 2016, uh, like in the second half of the year, we moved our main legacy app into Kubernetes, which involved us deploying the final stuff to production like a week or two before Black Friday, which was totally safe and sane. Uh, and in Google Cloud, what in those like in the cluster that Google automatically like provisions for us, they set up logging aggregation that like gets the standard output from every Docker container you run and forwards that, that to Google Cloud Stack driver logging, which is like their hosted logging solution and works reasonably well, except it's stupid expensive. Um, so then we had to do some sort of hacky stuff, including tail dash effing log files in the background to get logging it to be in standard out, which is gross, but works surprisingly well and 
actually worked where the other solutions would be us like hacking like stuff that Google set up for us, which would we, we'd rather not do. Um, so then when it comes to like rolling deploys and like pulling, killing Docker containers and bringing up new ones, obviously any long running process you, so you have die with those old versions of Docker containers. So cron and long running processes in general both are affected by this. So we haven't really solved the solution properly in production yet. We, there are a couple different ideas like Kubernetes has scheduled jobs now where, which is like a cron scheduler, but at Kubernetes level, so it manages each one as its own independent container and make sure, and will like do reporting on whether it successfully completed or exited with an error. Uh, but for now, our cron server is still just a dedicated server because we haven't had the time to properly move it over. And anything we have that runs longer than five minutes, which is sort of like the recommended max for letting a container die, we just also leave on the cron server, which is sort of a hack, but works for us for now because there's like a lot of work to do with other, just like general polishing that will help everything. Um, I have three, two, three more slides. Uh, so another popular like issue that happens with Docker is by default, which we only discovered like ho earlier last year is if you don't carefully read the docs and the Dockerfire reference, uh, it says that you should declare your Docker file sort of like the middle example where you declare an ex the executable that you're running in the Docker container and each argument as a separate argument string so your f service runs as PID one in the container instead of what it does, instead of that, if you don't do that properly, like the first example, it runs shell, a shell as your PID one, which then doesn't forward any signals to the process it's running, which sucks when you're trying to do a rolling update and trying to kill your Django app and then Unicorn's running under shell, which isn't forwarding the signal, so the shell gets a sig term and then dies and thinks the container's died, but it never actually told Django and Unicorn about the sig term, which sucks. Uh, so then the common like, solution to that is using Dominate, an amazing tool by uh, Yelp, which does the signal propagation the way you'd hope it does, where it would, will tell Django to die, wait for Django to die, and then die with it peacefully and happily. Um, Sorry, that was a bit morbid. Uh, <laughs> but where there's also some other like PID one issues where like Linux is weird about it, but dumb it in it solves that for us as well. Uh, I'm out of time, and I don't so I don't think there's time for questions. But happily speak to me afterwards. Uh, yeah, is that right? Yes. Cool. Thank you. Do you run your Kubernetes cluster across availability zones, or do you run multiple Kubernetes clusters in different availability zones? Uh, with the more recent versions, we could run across availability zones if we wanted, but we run within a single one. Within, it's not really a big enough like. We're not dealing with like proper like finance fintech stuff, so that if the whole of Google Belgium goes down. That would be an issue for us, but the, like the time warranted to like make it properly like across availability zones isn't really worth it for us. But there is native Kubernetes support now for federated clusters, which you set up like two separate Kubernetes clusters, and then they know like about each other. Is there anything else? Uh, so, have you looked at Helm for your deployments, and if so, uh, what was the motivation for not using it? Uh, so I spent about a week trying to move our stuff to Helm. Helm's really cool and I think it's a great project but for us it didn't really make sense. Uh, so the, the first big issue that I came into while trying to get our stuff to fit into Helm is that by default, and they're, they're only really interested in supporting the default Go templating engine from the like default Go standard lib, which is pretty like limited. It doesn't let you do 
like extend other templates which we rely on quite heavily with Ginger 2 because often different services, like that's the easiest way to do stuff because some services just rely on different command or like arguments to the Docker container. So doing that in Helm just seemed like it would be a huge mission. And there was like an old GitHub issue to support Ginger 2 as well, which would have made our move into Helm a lot easier. And they were like, no, no one seems to really care about this, so we're not gonna support it. And I don't unfortunately have the time to add that support or know Golang well enough. Uh, but if it supported Ginger 2, maybe we'd reconsider though at the same time. The like whole tiller side of Helm where it supports running like multiple of the same projects within a single cluster and namespace also seemed like unnecessary overhead for us and making it work nicely seemed like it would need hacks. And at the moment, like just relying on pure Kubernetes and like our Ginger 2 stuff is maybe a bit gross, but at the same time, it boils down to pure Kubernetes stuff, which is pretty useful for maintaining everything. Cool. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, have you got any solutions for authentication or authorization in your cluster? For like internal? Yeah, so like separation between dev and prod or if you have the same cluster or separate clusters or just so general yeah. like, yeah. So we run, for staging and production, we run completely separate Google Cloud projects. Um, and with Google Cloud that we can rely on their like built-in IAM to deal with cluster authentication for us. So I could give like some developers read only access to production if I wanted, but I'd rather give everyone edit rights by default, which is a bit dangerous, I guess, but like, <laughs> it works well so far. And like we could get to the point where maybe like only our like CI servers have right access to our production cluster, but that's pretty easy with Google with Container Engine, which is rad, because it means we don't have to like mess with the Kubernetes configuration ourselves for like role based auth and stuff. Cool. Take a large person. Hi. Hi. Uh, uh, obviously, you'll be speaking and touting Kubernetes now. Mm -hmm. Technically, I mean, you mentioned documentation is a weak point, but technically, where do you see the first wall of scaling coming as you grow? For us. Uh, yeah. I think at the moment it would just be like operational knowledge and a limit on that within our team. Uh, like there are definitely parts of it that are a bit fast factored because of rushing and us doing stuff, but like we could easily scale our cluster up to 10x, 100x. Uh, I don't think Kubernetes or Docker and all that networking and everything would be an issue for us. Cool. Is that Sweet. Okay. Let's thank Will.